Rub up your engines! Old President Biden says that by 2030, half the vehicles sold in the United States have to be electric cars. But here's what he's signing, a non-binding executive order, whatever the heck that means. Well, I decided to look up the legal leads about non-binding, right? Non-binding contracts are typically used when two parties want to put down preliminary discussions on paper to make sure they're on the same page, but don't want to agree to anything yet. As usual, it's hot air from from the politicians floating on the atmosphere. <laughs> a non-binding executive order. In other words, it means absolutely nothing. Talk, blah, blah. Now, I'd love to know how you can force half of the Americans buying cars to buy electric cars. We still live in a capitalist society where people just have choices of what they're gonna buy. That's the whole idea of capitalism, that if somebody makes a better product, better price, people will buy it, they'll succeed, and the people that make poorer products or charge more than others will go out of business because people won't buy their stuff. The government can't tell us what we have to buy. A non-binding executive decision, whatever the heck that means, is it really gonna Effect all that much. And of course, all the car makers are joining in the bandwagon. It's going down the street, like on the 4th of July, and they're all jumping on, oh yeah, we're gonna do that, blah, blah. But of course, they've already got little tiny ways to get out of it, and that they're including hybrid cars and plug-in hybrids as electric cars. Well, they're still mainly gasoline or diesel powered, so they got so many loopholes, they got more holes than Swiss cheese in them. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's just kind of hilarious, the nonsense that comes out of politicians' mouths these days and what they claim they're going to do, like they're going to force us all to, you know, we're going to have any choice, right? I mean, it's gotten to a point of absurdity with the nonsense that people spew out now. Now, Car and Driver has recently disputed the myth about electric vehicles that their maintenance costs are less. Car and Driver had a long-term Tesla Model 3, and here's what they found out after 30,000 miles of ownership. Now, of course, they don't need oil changes, right? You have to lubricate the brake caliper every year after 12,500 miles because you don't use the brakes much because of regeneration so they stick and they have to be lubricated. Now car and driver said they spent as much money doing that as it would have with oil changes. They spent $432 having that done. Another thing, the Model 3 ate up its Michelin tires in 30,000 miles because the car's heavy and it has less usable tread on it. Those tires aren't cheap boys as often as you do with a combustion engine and car and driver spent $1,000 157 bucks changing those four tires out. Now, their Model 3 also had to change the glass roof and the windshield because stone chips hit it. Maybe not the greatest quality glass that they're using. That was another $3,300 in repair costs. The glass roof was 1200 bucks and the windshield was 1100 bucks. And of course, since it's Tesla, they're the only ones that perform the services. And of course, they charge more money than anybody on the planet. That's just how those things go. You bought this luxury electric car, they ream you. It's just how it goes with those companies. So if you think that this electric car stuff, oh, we don't have to spend much money on maintenance and repair, ha ha ha, it's not true. That's a myth too. <laughs> and car and driver proved it with an actual Model 3 that they drove for 30,000 miles. And they have no vested interest in anything. So, you know, I certainly would believe they spent an awful lot of money doing stuff. You wouldn't have to do it in other cars fast. Repairs are outrageously expensive. Other things have to be done that don't have to be done in a normal car. You don't have to lubricate the calipers in your car every 12,500. No, that doesn't happen but it does on those because they'll stick because they're not used much and they rust. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's the first 30,000 miles. Imagine what goes on after that. Samir says, my dash lights disappear, but 12 volt battery is good. 15 Prius, 233,000 miles. Suddenly the dash light, everything goes dead and I can't lock the car through the remote. No power, but it works. After one or two minutes, the ignition turned on without clicking the power button. Then I'm able to start. Help. Okay, well, you got a lot of miles on a Prius. They're extremely complex cars, but I've seen this happen before. Pray it's exactly what happened to some of my customers' car. Replace the little bitty baby 12-volt battery. Not your giant battery pack that costs, you know, $10,000. The regular car battery, the little one that's in there. When they go bad on Priuses, I've seen that same exact thing. It's there for a reason, that auxiliary battery. But when they go bad, I've seen that exactly happen. So replace that battery. Now, if that doesn't fix it, woo! 
see. Find yourself a good Toyota Prius mechanic and bend over because it's probably going to cost a fortune to figure out what's going on electronically in that monstrosity of hybrid technology. But I've seen the bad regular little 12 volt battery the one that's in the trunk go bad and do exactly that. So pray it's just that small battery gone bad. Paul and Kathy says I got a very low idle after I had a dead battery in my 2000 Toyota Tundra. It idles at 300 450 RPMs or sometimes it dies. What can I do? All right, you said the car sat for a couple of months and the battery went dead. First, recharge the battery so that it's full or replace it. You said it's a new battery. They're not made to sit all along. And today, you get a new battery, it might be dead in two months. They don't make stuff like they used to. A lot of stuff's made like crap these days. Recharge the battery, have a guy check it, see if it's good. If it's still good after recharging it, Start the car, sit in the driveway for 10 minutes with you having your foot on the accelerator about 2000 RPM with everything turned off. Do the same thing at 2000 RPM for another 10 minutes with the AC turned on. That should get it accumulated so it will idle correctly and then just drive it around. Or if you're lazy, just drive the car around four or five days. The computer should reset. You don't have to have a mechanic like me reset the idle. It should reset itself after you drive it a while. That's the thing about Toyotas. You change the battery. A lot of times the idle gets funky until you drive driving around a while but you know if you want to really be cautious do the 10 minutes on with no AC 10 minutes with the AC on sitting in the driveway at 2000 RPM and it should reset itself so it'll go back to idling normal it's just the thing that happens with their software when the batteries go dead and then you got to either put another battery in or recharge your battery it's got to relearn the idle. Ozzy 17 says I need a 1995 Lexus ES 300 vacuum diagram you can subscribe to things you can buy a book and I just talked to the local office AutoZone guys here. Go to AutoZone. They have all data. AutoZone owns the all data data company. And I asked them the other day, a customer that wanted a wiring diagram for a Lexus. And they said, yeah, just go over. We'll print it out. They went over and they printed them out, the wiring diagram that they wanted, and handed them the piece of paper. Free. Didn't charge them anything. I mean, be a fair guy. Do business with them. Buy oil filters, whatever you want from them when you need the stuff. It's in their data system and they'll print it out. Like I say, I had a guy do it with the wiring diagram on a Lexus the other day. I'm sure they'll do it for you. Check with other companies maybe they do it too I just know the auto zones do it and there's an auto zone a mile from me here and there was one four blocks away in Houston and they do it so go ahead and go there take advantage of free stuff you don't get much free stuff these days you can get the vacuum diagram from them Al Worley says I got a 97 Honda motorcycle 23,000 miles dirt in the gas tank help me please I just purchased it's a shadow it's only got 23,000 miles my question it's got some dirt or oil in the gas tank I don't think it's rust did I make a good buy okay unless your friend had enemies that threw dirt or oil in a gas tank. Generally, it is rust. Motorcycle gas tanks are made out of steel. They're stamped pressed steel right? It will rust somewhat. Now, usually it's superficial. It doesn't really hurt anything. And if it's a 97 motorcycle, it's old as the hills and it will have some kind of rust on it. Now, if it runs okay and you got a filter on it, don't worry about it. But if you have problems, the only way to really fix it in a motorcycle, if you want to buy another expensive gas tank, it costs a fortune for them, is they have solutions where you take the gas tank off, then you throw like nuts and bolts inside, shake it up, and then you empty it out to get the rust parts off. Then you clean it with air, compressed air, sealing set. They make it for sealing motorcycle tanks. You put the first one in, you shake it around, and then it covers it, and then the second one, you shake it around, and it seals it so it won't rust anymore, if you want to go that far. But if it runs okay, every stinker motorcycle I ever owned had rust inside it to some extent, except my Norton Interceptor, because it had a fiberglass gas tank on it, and it didn't rust. But they made fiberglass gas tanks illegal soon after in the United States, because they could crack and then cause explosions, where the steel will just bend, and then it won't leak. So they still make you have steel ones. They don't allow fiberglass ones for motorcycles. Well, at least they haven't as far as I know. I haven't seen any more fiberglass ones. Cap Smitty says, fleet cars. I'm looking at getting a couple of fleet cars for two of my workers. They put 25,000 miles here. What would be the best? I've been looking at the Honda HRV, Kia Solar, something similar. Get a Honda HRV. They're well made. They last a long time. They can go hundreds of thousands of miles. The Kia Souls, no. You could buy a Kia Soul. You might drive it 100,000 miles from zero to 100,000 miles. It might be a decent vehicle right but not from a hundred thousand miles up you're buying a fleet vehicle probably got mileage on it already the Honda would be a, such a better deal for your workers you're gonna buy two of them then you'd have the same vehicle you'd know that they'd be maintained the same you know they're both Hondas are well made I would not 
not buy a Kia for that. The Honda is three, four times the Kia. It's a much better vehicle. You'll probably pay a bit more. So what if you pay five, six grand more for a vehicle? If it lasts three to four times as long, you're making out like gangbusters. You don't want to just go on the cheap for the cheapest thing you can get because generally it won't last as long, especially if you're talking Honda versus Kia. It's a no brainer there. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.